Well, last week I was talking about the subject of thirst quencher, and it was the consequence of having talked about the living water of Christ flowing in each of our lives. And that is the Holy Spirit living in us, that he refreshes us, renews us, gives us a, a fresh taste of life each day, and that he wants to pour out his life through us. However, we talked about there is this possibility of grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit of God. We were in Ephesians chapter 4 last week where it says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And what's interesting, this week I was listening to James McDonald speak. If you don't know who he is, he's a pastor in Chicago. And he happened to briefly touch on this subject, and he gave a very succinct little definition that I thought was so good that I wanted to share it with you. He said that uh, grieving the Holy Spirit is doing something that God does not want you to do. And quenching the Holy Spirit is not doing something that he does want you to do. Let me state that again. That quenching the Spirit is not following through with what God lays before you. You're not doing what he's calling you to do. The Spirit wants to work. And then on the other side, grieving the Spirit is doing something God does not want you to do. And so essentially, that's what we were talking about last week, that in Ephesians it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. And it lays out for us there a number of things that clearly grieve the Spirit. We looked at these passages where it says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building other people up. That you are also to not have language that is coarse or vulgar or something of that nature, that the tongue gives a reflection of the heart of a person. And how you speak to others and about others reflects your maturity in Christ. And if you are not speaking according to God's will, he will convict you. And it does grieve the spirit when we utter words that are harmful and hurtful to other people. Then also we talked about this problem of anger. Now anger in and of itself is not a sin, but your anger causing you to do things that are not what God would desire, that is a serious problem. And a lot of people have anger that gets well out of control well too quickly. And the scripture even says that doing so gives the devil a foothold. That if you, you are an angry person, it opens the door for something, some spirit of evil to have a stronghold in you and to interfere with your life. Consequently, the scripture says to get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, and anything along that line, that it should not be a part of the life of a person who's walking with Christ, and that being a person of that nature grieves the Holy Spirit. We also talked about this idea that we need to forgive. The scripture says in, in Ephesians 4 there, where it says don't grieve the Spirit, that we are to forgive one another just as Christ forgave you. Now, you see, when one chooses not to forgive, you are grieving the Spirit of God. Now, I know there's some people who are sometimes unaware of their need to forgive, and that is a problem that they just allow the Holy Spirit to come and point that out in their lives. But it's more of a problem when you are clearly aware of the need to forgive and you are willfully choosing not to do so. That you're treating someone with angst and disgust and you don't want to be around them, don't want to have a relationship with them because you do not want to forgive them. And that grieves the Holy Spirit. Lastly, as a part of last week's teaching, we talked about the fact that sexual immorality and impurity grieves the Spirit of God. God calls his people to be a holy people. He created sex. Sex is a good thing in the context of marriage between husband and wife, but only in that context. That outside of that context, it always wounds and harms and destroys. And so God calls his people to be a holy people who honor him in their sexual activities. And so God calls his blessing upon that within the context of marriage, but outside of that, it brings grieving to the Holy Spirit. Now, I pray that the Spirit of God would be very, very, or that you would be very sensitive to the Spirit in your life. Because there are times that he brings conviction, but it's not like it's overwhelming, that you have to be sensitive to him to be aware of it. In fact, he brought conviction upon me this week. About a week or so ago, I was talking with a gentleman, we had a conversation, and I was talking about some circumstance I had been dealing with that did not involve him, but I was describing it, talking about the situation, people involved, and afterward, I really felt like the Spirit of God convicted me. 
that I was speaking negatively about that situation when I should have recognized that God put me there to do something good and I needed to stop speaking negatively about it. And so when I saw that same gentleman again about a week later, I told him, I said, I need to confess to you. I really felt like the Lord convicted me about that and I need to clear it up. You see, if you have that sense of conviction, you need to deal with it. You need to confess it, get it out, and move on. It wasn't that I had said anything that was terrible or used bad language or anything like that. It was just that I should have been speaking from a positive perspective instead of a negative perspective about that situation. And you see, being sensitive to the Spirit of God, you will come under conviction because He wants you to be a person who reflects Him in absolutely everything. Now this week, where I want to go is to talk about the Father heart of God. Now, actually, where it says Ephesians 4, that's left over from last week. That's a little mistake. We're not in that scripture this week. We're going to elsewhere, mostly in Matthew. But normally, if you've been around here a while, you know that I don't tend to talk about a subject related to some holiday or festival or whatever's going on. And in fact, I think it was around Mother's Day that I talked about the wrath of God. You know, it wasn't exactly like a, I planned it that way, but you should be careful about the wrath of mom because when she utters your full name, including your middle name, you have a problem, Right? But really, I did this week in praying about what to talk about. felt like the Lord led me to a scripture that was very, very much about fathers. And so I do want to address that in a variety of ways because when Father's Day rolls around, I'm sure it affects each one of us differently. That is, some people in this room, you had a great earthly father who blessed you in many ways and maybe that person's still with you and you're thankful for that. Maybe your father has passed and you're thankful even though you've grieved his passing. But anyway, you have this great sense of how you were blessed by your father. And then there's some people who had a fairly good father or you have a fairly good father who's done some good things but also there have been some things that have been real challenges for you. Then there are also people in this room, I'm sure, who had experiences with their earthly father that was not so good. Some of you might even have been abused. If you, some of you may have come to see the movie that we had here last night about I Can Only Imagine, or maybe you've seen it elsewhere. If you haven't, I, I don't think I've ever really recommended a movie, but I certainly recommend this one because it, the gospel of Christ is clearly laid out there. It's a true story. It brings so much meaning to why that young man wrote that song. But the reality was he was abused by an alcoholic father. And yet he walked with Christ, demonstrated Christ to his father. His father found Christ later in life. It's the whole story of redemption of Christ. But some of you may have had an experience like that where you had an earthly father who really wronged you and treated you poorly in a variety of ways. And then some of you may have had a situation where you didn't even know your earthly father. That he deserted you and had nothing to do with you. Or even if you knew who he was, he wouldn't even talk to you. Things like that. So I know for, for a group this size in the whole church body that there's a whole spectrum of how people look at their earthly fathers. And so I want to explore that from the standpoint of giving thanks for the things that you have been blessed by. And also for looking at the places where you need to forgive. And so to start this scripture, we'll go over into Matthew 7, where it says, now these are the words of Jesus. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open." Now, one of the things I've mentioned before is that taking a limited amount of scripture, just a couple verses like this, and building a large theology out of it is unwise. Because you must always think in terms of the entirety of Scripture, both the Old Testament and New Testament. And if you just pull out a certain Scripture from the Old Testament, you, you, you might say, well, we need to stone somebody over this. But then you've got to take that in the context of what Christ does in the New Testament. Like in the case of the woman uh, who was caught in adultery and brought before Christ, and the penalty for her would have been stoning in the Old Testament, and that would have been enforced in Old Testament days. And yet Jesus said to her, he first said to those who wanted to stone her, he who's without sin cast the first stone, and then he says to her, go and sin no more. So there what he did was renew the principle that adultery was wrong, but he did not renew the penalty for adultery because he came to fulfill the law on behalf of us so that he suffered the consequences rather than her. So you see... In that case, you've got to take the entirety of Scripture together to build a theology. And the same thing is true here. 
Because some people will take this scripture and say, oh, you can ask God for anything and he'll do it for you. You just have to have enough faith and so forth. Well, if you are asking according to his will, because the scripture says ask, uh, elsewhere, ask anything according to his will. If you are asking according only to your will, what you want, you cannot expect God to fulfill that. In fact, if God answered every prayer that you ever uttered about everything you ever wanted, it would not be good. It's just like, have not your children, those of you who have had children, have not they asked many times for things that you did not give them because you knew it would not be in their best interest? In fact, this is true. I heard this Episcopalian, I'm pretty sure he's an Episcopalian priest speaking many years ago. And he said, it is a good thing that God does not give you everything that you, answer, that you pray for. Because if he did, I would be married to 32 women. <laughs> you know, he said like, you know, I'd, I'd meet one. I'm like, oh, she's the one God bring her into my life. And then, mm, nope, that didn't work. Then the next, the next, the next. You know, not everything that we pray for is God's will. And so there is this reality that you must seek what is his will and then pray accordingly. And so that's true with regard to the scripture that's raised here in Matthew. That certainly God does want you to ask. He does want to bless you. He wants to bring good things in your life. But you must submit to him and ask, Lord, is this your will? Now if we jump over to the book of James, it says this. He says, you want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have. In other words, you're trying to get things in this world by your own strength and your manipulation or whatever it might be. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. In other words, there are things that you need, you want in life, you need to ask of him. He says, but then there's another problem. When you ask, that is, you ask God, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That what you want, you want it just to spend upon your own selfish pleasures. Now look, there's some things that you can ask God about. You can expect him to say yes. In other words, let's say you're a married man. You've got two children and you are working for a company and the company went under and suddenly you don't have a job and you want to provide for your family. You want to take care of them and you are begging and pleading God to give you a job to provide for your family. Is he going to answer that affirmatively? And the answer is yes. Because you are seeking to do something that by definition he has appointed you to do. To be the provider of your family. And he is going to say yes if your heart is calling out for that. But if you are crying out for selfish things for yourself. In other words, you want personal things and you are not taking care of your family. Or you're not concerned about other people. And you're just functioning in a selfish way. You cannot expect God to say, sure, I'm going to bless you. You must have right motives, right desires, seeking his will. So then we jump back over to the book of Matthew. And it goes on, the very next verses say this. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? In other words, Jesus is talking about the nature of God, saying that he wants you to ask him. He wants you to come before him and say, Lord, this is what I need. It's like, let's say that your, your car just totally died and you need a car to get to work and you're begging and pleading. God will show you some gift. He might even surprise you. Somebody might even give you a car in a way to bless you. And so he says, come and ask that, he says, earthly fathers give good gifts. Like if your earthly father, if you ask him for a fish, would you give him a snake? He says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. And notice I stopped there because that scripture continues. I want to explore that part for a little while. Now notice where he says, if you, though you are evil. Now, it's quite clear that God understands the heart of human beings, that all of us have a sin nature that still affects us. Not all of us have pure motives in all things. He says, but even though you might have evil in your heart, you are still able to give good gifts to your children. Maybe not all of the time, maybe not completely. Some of you receive better gifts from your fathers than others. Now, when I'm saying good gifts, I don't mean just material, physical gifts. I mean gifts of relationship and blessing and things like that. You know, there is something true about the father blessing the children. In the Old Testament days in particular, the patriarch of the family would, would, would bestow a blessing upon his children and children's children. 
And a father can be very, very important in blessing his own family, his grandchildren, and that continues a long legacy. On the other hand, sometimes fathers do not extend any blessing into their children. They desert them, abandon them. They despise their own children, reject them. And so Jesus was saying here that even fathers who are evil can bestow good gifts. And so the question I would ask you to explore is, what would you say about your earthly father? And partly here, you might look at this from several different perspectives, depending upon your age and where you are in life. In other words, you might think about your own earthly father, and some of you might think about yourself as a father to your children. And I want you to really contemplate what you received or did not receive in that regard. Now, some years ago in the men's ministry, I brought out this list that I created to think about what constitutes a great father. And I'm going to use the same list, and I want you, as I go through it, to explore in your own mind and in your own heart, again, about your earthly dead, but for those of you who are fathers, about how you're doing as a dad. So the first question here is this. Was your father the spiritual leader of your household, or is he the spiritual leader of your household now? Is he a Christian? Does he live his life accordingly? He's not caught up in legalism and things like that that make you want to reject his belief, but he genuinely reflects Christ. Now, it's unfortunate that I would dare say if we took a survey of the entire nation, not just church-going people, but all people, we would find that in the majority of the cases, probably 75% or more, the father is not the spiritual leader of the household. And God calls men to be spiritual leaders, not with a forceful hand, but as servant leaders who model Christ to their own family, who are willing to give up themselves to reflect love to those who are a part of their family. The second question is this. Is your father a good provider? Did he meet the needs of your family? Or was he a workaholic who placed work ahead of relationships? Did you hardly know your father because he was too busy building his career or his business or something of that nature? Did your father openly display love and affection for your mom? In other words, he hugged her and kissed her and made you laugh at him and do silly things because they were doing that. But did he show affection to your mom in front of you? You know, young boys get their concept of what it's like to be a man from the role model of their father. And young girls get the concept, obviously, from their mother. They get their sense of acceptance from the opposite parent. In other words, a young girl feels accepted and secure by her dad and vice versa. But do you know where all of the kids get their sense of security? It's in the relationship of their parents. If they see their parents loving each other and protecting each other and taking care of each other and showing respect for each other, it gives them a sense of security. And so that's why I put in this question. Did your Dad, openly display love and affection for your mom. Did your father administer fair and just discipline in your home? Do you know it is an unloving thing not to discipline a child? In other words, just to let them do anything they want basically says what? You don't care. So it is not a loving thing to let them get away with anything they want. In fact, the, the idea that you should never administer any type of discipline does not recognize the sin nature of human beings. And once you have a clear understanding of the fallen nature of human beings, you know that discipline is absolutely pertinent. However, 
On the other end of that, you could have a disciplinarian who was too harsh and hurtful and abusive and all those types of things. There is certainly a godly balance. Does God discipline his children? Yes, he does. Does he do it with love and care? Yes, he does. Did your dad have any significant vices? In other words, was he addicted to anything? Was he an alcoholic? Did he have some kind of other addiction? Did he commit adultery? Do you realize that dads committing adultery, you are abandoning your primary responsibility in your own household? And see, that's a tough thing to really assess. In fact, sometimes when I'm counseling people, I'll ask them that question. Was your dad faithful to your mom? And sometimes, a lot of the time, they say no. Sometimes they say, I don't know, but I think he wasn't. See, there's some real serious questions there. Was your father a good role model as a father and as a husband? In other words, did he reflect Christ? If you lived your life in the same way that he did, would that be a legacy that you would be glad that you upheld? Do you realize all too often the sins of the fathers are passed to the next generation and the next and so on? And oftentimes the sons end up doing the very thing they declared they would never do, but they are repeating the actions of their fathers. Did your father encourage you in terms of developing your skills and abilities? In other words, did he help you understand where you're talented and gifted and also where you're not? We all have different types of talents. Some people are skilled with their hands and some people are skilled in other ways, whatever it might be. Did your father help you understand your gifts and abilities so that you could explore some pathway to be a provider for your own family? Or did he discourage you and tell you you'd never amount to anything? Or did he try to force you to be something that you are not? Unfortunately, I know stories of dads who tried to force their children into a certain box because that's what they expected of them rather than encouraging that child to be the person that God had created them to be. Did your dad give you guidance on sexual matters? You know, I've asked, I won't do it today, but I've asked this question in a large setting and I've asked people a show of hands. How many of you, don't, don't raise your hands, but I've asked, how many had a dad who gave you advice and guidance on sexual matters and do you know always a minority, a small minority of hands go up? You know, sometimes I've asked, how many of you had a mother who gave you advice? And you know what? Still, usually a minority of hands go up, but slightly higher than dads. Now, do you know why dads are afraid to talk to their children about sexual matters? Because they are afraid their children will ask them what they did. Do you know what the right thing to do is? Is to admit to them your failures. How painful it was to have failed. And be clear with them that you want something better in their lives. That God has forgiven you and you hope they can walk a better path. Particularly for you young men, did your father encourage you to treat young women, or women at all, with respect and honor? Did your dad impart to you an understanding of how important it is to treat women with respect and honor? Or to disrespect them? Did your dad love you personally? In other words, you knew he cared about you. He invested in you. 
He went to see the things that you cared about. I remember once years ago, I was counseling this young lady, asking her about her dad. She was, a, she was an athlete. She'd been involved in the sport. And, and I, she said to me, just started bawling, and said her dad never once came to one of her games. Not one time. He was too busy working. See, what he said was, I don't care. I care more about me and what I want to accomplish than about you. Now, that list is a pretty, uh, it's not comprehensive. I mean, we could think about some more things, but it's a pretty tough list. Do you realize this? Every person in this room, no exceptions, needs to forgive their father. See, some of you could say, I had a wonderful, great father. Nobody had a perfect father. There's only one perfect father, and that's the Father in heaven. Whoever in this room, you know, in fact, there's some dads in this church. I've watched them for several years. They are great, but they're not perfect. Do you realize Every human being needs to choose to forgive their earthly father. A few years ago, not too many years ago, I sat down with that list, all of my kids, my wife at the dinner table, and I gave myself a self-examination. And I said, these are the things I think I've done well, and these are the things I have not done so well. And I made it quite clear to them they needed to forgive me for the things I had not done so well. I acknowledged my frailties, weaknesses, but it is their responsibility to forgive or not. And likewise, every one of us must choose in our own hearts to forgive our dads where they were not perfect. See, I go down that, own, that list, and you've heard me talk enough about my own dad. Obviously, I loved him. He loved me. But there are some areas there where he failed miserably. My dad was never ever the spiritual leader in our household. I never heard him pray until the last year of his life. In other words, out loud where I knew. Now, I'm not saying that as any negative or mudsling against him. I've forgiven him. I loved him. In fact, I didn't even realize I needed to forgive him for not being the spiritual leader until several years after I'd become a Christian and the Lord began to show it to me. Didn't even know I needed to forgive him. But I chose to do so. Now on the other side of that, we also need to be thankful for the ways in which our dads did some things well. Now, there might be a few people here who would say, mine did nothing well. I understand that. There are those. But for most of us, we had imperfect dads who were trying hard. You ever think about this? See, you don't realize this when you're a young person. You just can't. But when you're like 40 years old and you think back about what your parents were like when, you, when they were 40 and you were a young person and you, were try, you had expectations for how they should do things, you had no idea of their struggles. They were dealing with their own stuff, their own difficulties, their own sin nature and all the things they were dealing with and trying to be a good parent is a lot harder than you realized. And if you're really young now, someday you'll realize that same thing. That you had no idea what they were going through. And so you need to stop and think about what did they do well. 
For what should I be thankful? Shortly after my dad died, my wife and I were talking and we got into a little conversation and we said something like, what would describe his life? If you had to summarize his life, what would it be? And we both independently came to the same conclusion. We both said something to the effect of, well, he loved people. If I could summarize his life, it would be he loved people. And then after saying that, the more I thought about it, I thought, wow, that's actually a pretty good thing. Because the greatest commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And what? Love your neighbor. And what characterized his life was he loved people. So I, there are areas where he failed, and I've forgiven him. But I'm also, I think that I understand the, the loving heart of God the Father because of the loving heart of my earthly father. Some of you immediately might say, well, I don't. Well, let me say this. Every void that your earthly father left, in other words, every place where he failed, every mistake he made, your heavenly father wants to fill. See, everything in your life that was not filled by your earthly father, your heavenly father wants to fill. In other words, everything on that list, God can fulfill everything that I mentioned there. Now, in order for you to understand that and live in that, you must choose to forgive your earthly father. Because we're talking about the living water of Christ, the spirit flowing into your life, in order for him to fill the voids in your life that were left by your earthly father, you must forgive your earthly father and turn to your heavenly father and expect him to fill those voids in your life. And he will. He is phenomenally good at doing so. There is not a single thing that your earthly father could have failed in doing that your heavenly father cannot repair, renew, redeem, and bring blessing into your life. Not one. You might say, well, my earthly father never gave me any guidance in sexual matters, and I went out and made mistakes in the sexual area. What does God the Father say to you? He forgives you, wipes you as clean and as pure as snow, and you start over, and he renews your life, and he brings good blessings into your life. But see, you need to forgive your earthly father and allow your heavenly father to bring blessings. And he will do it. See, the rest of that scripture says this. He says, even though you, being evil, give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, in our Western culture, we think good gifts are material. The best gifts of God are not material. The best gifts of God are relational. The people that he brings into your life, that he allows you to have joy and pleasure with. I have to tell you about one little kid who God has undoubtedly crossed my path with in the last couple of years. He goes to church. I won't use his name because I didn't ask his parents if I could do so, but I don't think they'd mind. But he's a little guy. I asked him how old he was, and he's like, he, he tried to get three fingers up. He didn't quite get it. I'll be standing and talking to people. He comes up and running and tackles my leg. And says, hey, pistol. He lets me pick him up and hug him. I set him down. He goes off. He did so after the first service today. He almost took me down one day. He hit me so hard. He is such a little blessing. His parents did not put him up to that. He started doing it on his own. He's like, Peter Russell, can I go see him? And he, they say, okay. And next thing you know, boom, he hits me in the leg. 
See, th that's a little blessing from God. Priming me for grandchildren. <laughs> you see, the best gifts of God are relational. Let me say this too. Some of you didn't have an earthly father who invested in your life. God has a way of bringing other people, godly people, into your life to replace that void. I won't mention who, but I know a person whose earthly father was an alcoholic, not a blessing, but this person's stepfather was a genuine reflection of Christ who filled the void left by her earthly father. God has a way of bringing the right people in to fill the voids that may have been left and renewing. Some of you may have had a father who died early. It wasn't anything he could control. It was, there was no sin involved. And there was a void left in your heart. But God had a way of bringing others to fill that void. Maybe you're at a place where even right now you've lost your dead. You can expect God to fill that void somehow. Many years ago, when the last of my grandparents, my grandmother died, there was a sweet, sweet, sweet lady in our, who came to our home group. We had a home Bible study. And she just sort of said, I'll be your grandmother. And she was. For a long time, she's passed too. But she just sort of stepped in and said, I'll be your spiritual grandmother. And the Lord works that way. He fills the voids. It's interesting, I was teaching this in the first service, and the Lord reminded me of this, and I'll share it with you. Because as I say, sometimes fathers... Earthly fathers leave a gap, and there's nothing they could have done about it. When I was a kid, I learned that my grandfather on my mother's side died before I was born. I never met him. I knew a little bit about him, saw a few pictures. And then I, I'd heard that he died when my mother was in the eighth grade. Now, as a young person, that did not register, nor did I adequately comprehend what that meant. Then many years passed, and for some reason, the Lord did something that was, I thought, unique. There was a day where I was really dwelling upon that, and I, feel, I believe the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, allowed me to emotionally experience what went on with my mom. See, she was an only child. Her mother had a number of miscarriages. She was never able to have other children, and and then her father died when she was in the eighth grade, left her and her mom alone. He died from an, uh, an enlarged heart due to a leaky heart valve, which today would be not a complex surgery to deal with, but in those days they didn't have anything. And what I think the Lord allowed me to do was that one day was experience the hurt and agony in her soul of losing her dead when she was in the eighth grade. And it really helped me to understand her much better. And maybe some of you have had an experience like she did. I'm confident the Lord wants to bring healing in that place and replace and renew that area sometimes by bringing other people into your life who will be a blessing to you. But now you see, I am convinced that God is a good father. That he wants to restore and renew everything that was not done by your earthly father. You have one responsibility. That is to forgive your earthly father. And recognize what God the Father wants to do in you. Now Louis is going to come and help us celebrate the best father.